The record's taking a while. There we go. So thanks for joining us, everyone, for the second webinar uh, for our Innovator Series of Webinars. Um, Mariana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce myself, and, and I'm going to apologize, first of all, because I went ahead and changed the, the name of the presentation on you guys. Uh, and it's kind of the same content under a different name, but I wanted to talk a little bit about learning like a journalist. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm, I'm Mariana from Brazil, uh, from Rio. I'm currently in Sao Paulo uh, from the BRZ17 cohort. And before I worked in education, I spent, um, this is me in Hong Kong, um, in an art department of a magazine about 15 years ago. And I spent most of my adult life in newsrooms, um, in our department of newsrooms, because I am a designer and a journalist by training. And what an art director does is um, learn about all these interesting things that, that reporters, journalists are reporting on and find out the best way of communicating uh, those things to different audiences. So. Um, it's, it's very interesting because you're learning all the time and then you're communicating about what you're learning all the time. And, um, you know, it sounds a lot like what school should be like. And it was certainly a lot of fun. Uh, and about six years ago, I started working in schools. I became ed tech coordinator at a school in Rio, kind of by accident, because I went in to do a communications and design, or actually a rebranding of the school and do their uh, communications. And, um, but what's interesting about this profession is that you can't help but develop a very inquisitive mind because you know, you're learning about all these different things all the time and you're trying to ask questions and find out what's the best way of, of telling people about all those things that you're learning. So I'd like to propose a quick exercise on thinking like a journalist. Um, suppose you walk by um, a little, shoe repair store on your way home every day from work. Um, and, you know, there used to be maybe a couple of these stores in your neighborhood. And all of a sudden you notice that there is only one. And then one day you notice that it's gone. So my question to you, if you take just a minute and write in the chat or just think to yourselves, uh, what questions would you ask when you notice something like that? Uh, what will go through your mind? What would you want to know? So I'm going to give it a minute and see if you can come up with something. So imagine the, uh, the neighborhood two stores disappeared. Um, and then what would you ask yourself? I think I have to move over to the chat. And I'm going to generate a little echo here. What online company is going to meet this need? When was it at its peak? Where is the shoemaker? How did he begin his career? All very good questions. <laughs> what happened to the people working there? The big box put them out of business. Good question. OK. This is a good exercise. Um, here are the questions that I would ask. Just off the top of my head, some things that I thought about. Why are shoe repair stores disappearing? Is gentrification driving the extinction of certain services? Are today's products less durable? As goods get cheaper, do we repair things less, maybe? And why are products getting cheaper? Is it having an impact in certain professions? Uh, how about planned obsolescence? We might research and find this expression. Um, how is it impacting our buying habits? Are we discarding more stuff instead of repairing things? Is there an environmental cost to this? Um, how did he learn this craft and did he pass it on to somebody? Where's it going to go? And how many crafts or professions have disappeared? So we could go on and on um, up to where is the real social and environmental cost of producing, transporting, selling, and discarding a pair of shoes. Now, notice how just by having the habit of asking questions, um, I went from a neighborhood shoe store to the environment very quickly. And as every journalist knows, there is a lot of stories within any one story. There's many angles that we can explore. Um, 
and this is how journalists operate. You know, they look at something and they think at all the different stories that could be um, found within that one story. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting way of, of thinking about learning about things and observing things. And I'd like you to take a turn at it. Um, we're going to think about a topic that's pretty universal that everybody knows a little bit about, which is international sports events, the Olympics. We just had the Olympics not too long ago in Brazil. Uh, and if you go to this document, bit.ly find a story. And if you could, in the first column, right in the first column here, join this document, in the column that says observe, uh, if we were to practice thinking like a journalist, suppose you're in Brazil, uh, the Olympics are about to begin or have just begun, what kinds of stories would you like to find out about? If you take a line just in the first column, um, because we're gonna build something here along this hour, Oh, wow, that's an excellent question. How did COVID affect athletes' training? Right, we have an Olympic coming up. We did. We were going to have an Olympics this year. All right, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Where do athletes stay? There are lots of stories there. All right, just the first column because we're gonna go back to this a little later on. You're doing good. What impact does travel to the events have on the environment? What is the relationship between athletes and their sponsorship opportunities? Great questions, guys. Oh, I like this one. How has training changed over the years? Okay, has everybody had a chance to put a question in there? I guess so. I don't know how many people have joined us. So I'm going to move on. We're going to go back to this document a little bit later. Okay. So we're talking about observing things like a journalist. The fact that every story has many stories within, and there's lots of uh, angles that we could choose to investigate and report on. Now, um, because I have this background, uh, when I went to work in education, and I have this kind of journalistic mind, and, and, and I was uh, so used to um, telling stories, finding visual ways of telling stories. Uh, when I started working with technology and education, this became my focus very quickly because this is what I related to my previous experience. How might we create deeper learning experiences and develop media literacy through investigation and storytelling? In fact, my innovator project, my innovator academy project was around this topic. Um, and I started becoming really interested in how we could leverage technology um, towards media creation and journalism for the purpose of learning, right? When I started working in schools, we were right in Brazil at the transition from this type of classroom, which is very much the, the type of classroom that I studied in, um, in which we, um, the question would be, how do we absorb or retain knowledge, all these passive verbs, right? Um, how do we demonstrate what we've learned, usually in the form of a test? Um, and we are working very hard in Brazil to transition to this type of class classroom. This is a photo actually that I took at a school in California, at a public school in California. Um, and here the verbs are very different. They're much more active, right? Um, this kind of learning is about how do we access knowledge. Of course, in, in the moment where um, we no longer have the knowledge um, personified only you know, in, the, in the figure of the teacher or locked in books, 
uh, knowledge is everywhere. Information is everywhere. We can access it through our cell phones. And so the question becomes, how do we access it? How do we analyze it? How do we build knowledge from all this information and how to communicate what we've learned? Now, this, to my delight, looks very much like a newsroom. Um, this is very much what we would do in our professional practice when we would investigate something and collaborate because uh, journalism and design and journalism are very collaborative um, professions, operations. Um, so how would we work? Uh, there's people investigating, there's people looking at books, people are on the internet, they're planning something, they're building something to communicate what they've learned. This is what we want for the 21st century classroom. And to my delight, it looks very much like a design studio and it looks very much like a newsroom. So I started realizing that maybe I was, you know, onto something there um, and that we could in fact learn to learn like a journalist. And because I've always had this focus on being inquisitive because of my profession and because I'm a designer and designers by nature, they ask questions. This is how we work. We ask questions. I know for a fact that questions can lead to change. Um, and when we transpose this to a school setting and we think about inquiry-based learning, um, we find out that it's meaningful because it connects to things that have to do with students' reality. Um, it's student-centered. It lets them take center stage and go investigate things that they're interested in. It's very active. Um, it has to be, by nature, very media and technology infused as we research, as we access information, as we create media, as we analyze media, which is where we're going to find all our information. Uh, it's how we're going to contact other people. And it's often very biased towards creativity and action because when you find out about something, when you explore a subject, then the next logical step is to create something with it and to act upon it, do something that will actually have an impact in your environment, in your community, in your society. So um, this is very typical of something that I would find in the school that I was working in Brazil when I first started working with technology. Um, the teacher would have a topic and the students would then present something about that issue, which they research on the internet, Wikipedia sites and books. Um, and this is where the project would end. So this is very much describing an issue. This is a poster about uh, religious intolerance, and it's motivated by the fact that some um, fundamentalists were um, persecuting the, the uh, people who were practicing the African-based religions. And so basically what the student did here is he described the issue there's a lot of things that he found on the internet and simply Xeroxed and pasted here. Um, this is very much a discovery stage of the issue. It's not very creative and it has a very high copy and paste potential, sadly. And this is not what we want. And so when we start taking this a little further and we ask questions, why is there religious intolerance? Uh, who is suffering through this and what is causing it? And what is the impact on people's everyday lives? And how can we get people to relate to others that are different? How can we talk about our 30? How, we how can we talk about diversity? How can we promote empathy? And so when we go to these questions, um, we might come up with very different projects. And this is something that we actually did at the school. We talked about intolerance. We talked about, uh, quickly we went uh, to refugees and migrations. Um, and then the students decided that it was a problem of empathy and that we, if we could interview people that were refugees and tell their stories, um, we would then realize that there are people just like us and, you know, they're going through all these difficulties and in their journeys and so on. And so what the student did here on the left is that he's creating a map um, of of people that he interviewed here we're just illustrating it with a found image but he was going to place on the map where people came from um, before they came to brazil and he decided that all pictures were going to be black and white so that he would have uniformity and then he would have a first person narrative there uh, which is a way of informing the audience about the issue and also engaging the audience 
Um, if you go a little further, then you can start talking about solutions. And one of the projects that came out of this group, and this is this is a stock image, um, we didn't actually get to implement this, was to get these people, these refugees, to cook um, and help them set up a catering service uh, to help them integrate better into our community. So this is very different. This is the solution stage. It's not just describing an issue, but as uh, trying to get people engaged with it and presenting solutions. It's very analytical. We have to research, we have to connect things, and it's highly creative as we create narratives or we search for solutions. So it's very different kind of production. Um, and so I started working with the idea that we could learn like a journalist, um, and this would be a really effective strategy um, towards a number of things that we want to achieve in the 21st century school. First of all is uh, it lets you teach 21st century skills like collaboration, creativity, communication, um, empathy. Um, it lets you practice higher order critical thinking because you have to access all this content, different formats of media. You have to, to combine things that you find you can't just simply copy and paste something. You have to create something all, out of all this information that you're finding. It lets you engage with the world beyond the classroom. Um, and it lets you develop media literacy. It's, it's a good way of working media literacy into everyday school practice. Um, and this is a real interesting part of, of this work because um, as we're in this scenario where information is so abundant, it's everywhere. There is a deluge of information everywhere, but it's definitely not the same as knowledge. You know, there's a lot of it around, but not all of it is very trustworthy. So how can we sift through all this information? How can we make sure that all of these things there, that are coming at us from all these different sources all the time, social media, the news, um, posters, advertising, how do we create knowledge out of all this? Um, because in fact, being informed and having access to high quality information is a right. It's a necessity in, in, a, in our society. Um, is we need to be informed in order to have access to the services, in order to make the choices that we need to make in our society and that we have the right to make. So media literacy is very much a right. It's also, we also have a right to communicate. We also have a right to take part in the larger conversation. And so this is very much a part of building knowledge and learning in today's society in school and beyond. And it's something that we really have to build. Um, this became my innovator project. It was something called Media Makers. At first we meant to um, uh, train teachers to use all these skills that had, they came from the design field and the journalism field, like um, making videos, making infographics, timelines, creating graphic design. Um, but then very quickly, we, we, this was about 2018, um, and the disinformation crisis was just really hitting its stride. And we did this hackathon, which was um, very fun. And there were a lot of, uh, at that time, current and future innovators there. Um, and it was called the Information Education Hackathon, in which we tried to create materials to teach about disinformation. Uh, there wasn't a lot of materials available in Portuguese. So we got journalists, designers, and educators together. Um, and we did this two-day immersion, and we created a lot of materials. And the seal says, educating for information is educating for citizenship. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and then from that, I went on to become coordinator of this media literacy program in Brazil, which is actually uh, at the moment sponsored by google.org. It's called Educa Media. And we created a curriculum based on these skills of reading, writing, and participating in a very connected world. So this was the evolution of my um, Google Innovator Academy project. And so um, this is the why of working with media in a school context. And then um, the next question is, so when do we do this? Because there is this, um, this pull between, should it be a separate subject? Should we teach, continue teaching media studies and media analysis or have a media studio? Or should it be 
horizontal. Um, and, and we kind of agreed that uh, in our teacher training efforts, we're going to treat this like something that needs to be done all the time. It needs to be integrated and it can be integrated into every su a subject matter all the time. Um, we want to integrate media decoding, critical thinking, and media creation across all subject areas because, in fact, if you're investigating, if you're dealing with uh, sources of information, if you're building knowledge in the sciences, in geography, in math, in physics, it doesn't matter, um, you're dealing with media decoding and critical um, reading and media creation issues. So the way we do this um, is we propose it as a, as a horizontal uh, skill and we try to train teachers to work with this uh, no matter what subject area they teach. Um, and when are they gonna do this? All the time. For example, when you have a text set uh, for your subject, we strongly suggest that you explore multimedia text sets so that you can look at the same content. Uh, maybe this is a, a set about refugees and on the left is a interactive map with a timeline that you can slide. Um, there's a lot of very interesting interactive content now, not only in media outlets, but also in cultural and scientific institutions. Museums put out a lot of this stuff. NGOs put out a lot of this stuff. So on the left is a map of migration movements around the world, and, and the dots represent the sizes, the number of, of people that are moving from one place to the other, and there's historical context. Um, on the top right is a, an animation from, the, from UNESCO, and it tells the story of a little girl who's a refugee. And you can look at media and see how the language changes over time. So these are just a number of different texts that you could explore um, as you're starting a, a subject, as you're starting a unit. And it doesn't have to be in the social sciences only, because if you deal with uh, quantities, if you deal with graphs, if you deal with math, maths, um, there is a lot of very interesting interactive content available now in journalism, in the media, and um, other parts of the internet. And so we have a chance to practice media decoding habitually all the time in all subject areas. This is an, a really interesting um, interactive animated timeline of the median temperature um, around the world. And you can see as the years go by, it's getting redder and redder and temperatures are getting higher and higher. So you could discuss with your students, for example, um, what is the difference between this type of graph um, and other types of graph? And is there anything that could lead us here to think a certain way, what choices were made? So we can talk about these media decoding and literacy issues um, in every subject. There's a lot of immersive um, content. Google Arts and Culture is one of my favorite sources of editorial uh, content that's very educational. Um, this is a special uh, that was done about the slums in Rio, about the favelas in Rio around the time of the Olympics. And the fact that it's interactive and immersive and you have a first person point of view uh, and then you have interviews, you can uh, manipulate a map. So all these are choices. All these are affecting our reading and our interpretation of the situation and the content. And we have a chance to talk about um, authorship, technique, purpose, et cetera, right? So um, whatever project you're doing, uh, there's always a chance to activate media literacy skills at every stage. So if you're at the research and discovery uh, stage, you can talk about search techniques, you can talk about evaluating sources, if you're planning the narrative that you're going to be building, you can talk about point of view, evidence, purpose. Uh, you can talk about different formats that you could build your narrative in. Uh, and if you're at the creative development stage, you can talk about how you search for images. You can talk about copyright. You can talk about audiovisual expressions. You can explore creation and publication tools. So all these opportunities uh, to infuse media literacy analysis and creation into uh, learning all the different subject areas, right? So I'd like to go back to our story about the Olympics, the question that you had. Um, and the idea here is that you're going to go to the second column now, and you're going to very quickly write for me 
in this second column, what would you consider to be a good source? Where would you go to look for information on the particular topic that you want to rehearse? Just one idea. Because one very important thing that we need to teach right now um, and that journalists do very well is evaluate what would be a good, trustworthy and reliable source for the particular type of information that they are looking for. Oops. And this is um, very often a stumbling block because I find that we often tell students to research something um, and either we give them the sites or the sources to research or we leave it very open-ended. And there was a very big teaching opportunity here because the, 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 the matter of, the, of analyzing the trustworthiness of a source uh, and being able to tell um, journalistic story from opinion, um, sponsored content from a research institute, from an NGO is key right now uh, to navigating through all this disinformation that we deal with all the time. So this is a very important part of learning like a journalist and teaching media literacy. Okay, I'm going to... Oh, some very interesting ideas here. Agencies, National Olympic Committees. Um, nobody's thinking of first-person interviews? You can also interview. A source can also be somebody who's directly involved or an eyewitness to the situation or somebody who's actually a character in your story, right? Cause University said, somebody said, if they sell advertisements, I am hesitant to recommend sites. Um, that's kind of tricky because right now there is a lot of very good um, scientists on the internet, people that are bloggers or YouTubers uh, that are quite respectable and we can research who they are. Uh, but the way they maintain their sites is through advertising. That doesn't mean they're any less trustworthy. Uh, the professional media that's bound to certain sets of standards, they have to have advertising. This is how they uh, keep their operation going. So um, a lot of people often say that, but that's kind of, um, you know, we, we have to, to think about that. Um, it's not, an, if there's an ad present, it's not an indication that the, the source is not trustworthy. That's what I want to say. Okay, I'm going to go back um, and we can continue building on that document a little later. So this is the why of why we want to use media and learn like journalists and the when. And the answer to the when is all the time because it's got, uh, it can bring something to every subject area. It gives us an opportunity to explore um, how do we get information and how do we build knowledge in every subject area. And then um, finally, there's the how, and these are my tips uh, for how to infuse media into learning um, and how to practice learning uh, and creating like a journalist. And this is my list of, of tips that I would like to leave you with. Uh, the first one is to encourage observation. And um, we did the exercise of thinking about the shoemaker, um, you know, and questioning something that we might walk by every day. The other day I developed an activity for kids who were staying at home right now during um, isolation, during the lockdown in certain cities. Um, and the idea was to have them observe uh, their environment, their household, and answer the question, what has changed in your family's routine because of the social distancing? in the lockdown in certain cities. Um, what can you tell us about that? And how can you show us? So we're having them do a photo story 
and encouraging them to look at the details that tell the story. Maybe somebody has a new corner in the living room that wasn't there before where the family works or the parents work in their home office situation. You know, there's all kinds of things. Maybe there's a view from their window. Maybe they can see their neighbors exercising at home. Um, and I like to show them this example of uh, and talk about when when travelers and artists and explorers and journalists traveled um, in centuries before, um, they would often take down notes and make quick sketches as a way of registering things uh, to elaborate later, either to create a painting or a scientific investigation or even tell a story in a publication. This is an, a travel notebook from Eugene Delacroix from a, tra a trip to Morocco in 1914. And it's very beautiful. What strikes me though, is how he is looking at tiny details of how people dress and what the architecture looks like and making notes, uh, what the movements were, what people were doing, uh, because through all these details, he's gonna be able to build a bigger picture. Uh, and journalists kind of do the same thing. You look at the details, uh, that make up a larger story. So one of the things that we, we need to do and that I like to do is encourage kids to, to observe the details. Um, and obviously you can tell, even though there are no pictures of the Empire State Building of the Statue of Liberty, you can probably tell that this is a collage of images from New York. I made this from when I lived there. Um, and I like it because it's a collection of details that tell a story about how energetic and diverse and varied this city is. So we can compose, you know, this is a way of saying that we can tell a bigger story with a collection of details. And often journalists do that. Um, the other thing that um, sometimes uh, teachers skip is, and I find this is particularly true over here, is that we kind of step over the inquiry process when we assign a media creation piece, we, we basically spend a lot of time talking about the tools and the video and the editing and the steps that they're gonna take. And we forget that we need to scaffold the building of, of the statement. What is it that they're going to tell? Uh, what are the questions? What is the main question? What other questions arose from that one, which, you know, the exercise that we just did. Um, and I love using hyperdocs for that because um, I, can, I can make sure that everybody's gonna uh, meet all, you know, what needs to be done. Everybody's gonna be able to understand what the stages are and they're going to be able to have us to craft a solid argument and find good evidence and look for good sources and get me a couple of quotes and data and everything that we need to build a good story. So we can step over that. Um, and I can send you a link. This is in Portuguese, but um, I think I have an English version somewhere. But it's basically a hyperdoc that walks kids through the steps of inquiry, of investigation, as well as the video production that came after that. Um, the next step is, I'd like to say to the teachers that I train, ask a story how it wants to be told. What do I mean by that? Depending on the kind of story you have, depending on what you want to highlight, you may find that there's a better format. And these are some examples of a magazine that I did in my previous life as a magazine art director. Um, this is a magazine that celebrated the 30th anniversary of a very well-known um, Japanese restaurant in Rio. It's a very well-loved, very well-known restaurant. And so we had a number of stories. This particular one, uh, we wanted to tell people what is the day-to-day in a restaurant like that, like what happens behind the scenes from really early in the morning when they start getting supplies until well after the last client leaves and they're cleaning up the restaurant because people don't usually know that. You just show up and you have this beautiful meal. So we decided to tell the story in the form of a photo um, story uh, called 24 hours in the day of this restaurant and we actually broke it up by time slots. This is what happens at 7 a.m. This is what happens at 12 p.m. This is what happens at 3 p.m. when the staff has the meeting and this is illustrated with photographs and some captions. So basically this is a photo story. This other one is a profile of the chef and it's an interview. It's a really interesting and this guy has a, a long story and an interesting story. He traveled all over the world before he settled in Rio and so this is a long read, 
but we figured people also want to know what he looks like as well as reading his story. So we commissioned a portrait so that, so that people would know what he looks like. And it turned out very beautiful. Um, the next story is about the three sushi men who work at a restaurant. And they actually come from the north of Brazil, um, which it's kind of weird that they would come from this very different culture, very different background, and end up making sushi at a restaurant in Rio. And it's a story that has elements of adventure. Um, and so we got to thinking adventure, Japanese culture. What could we do with this? And so we commissioned the Japanese style uh, cartoon and manga illustration. And we did a comic about the story of the three sushi men. Uh, and that turned out really well. So there's numbers of ways that, that you can tell stories. And often a story, I like to say that if you think about what is the element that you want to highlight, the answer will come to you. Um, and of course, it, digital media, interactive media does this very well nowadays. There's things like timelines. You can tell stories with timelines. You can tell stories with maps. These, are, these maps represent the areas in the different states of Brazil that still have Atlantic forest. So there's a number of things that we can um, help kids create, right? And I'm giving you a, a cheat sheet here, which I, I find very useful. People often like that one, um, which is depending on what you want to highlight, if you want to explore data, well, the best format would be an interactive visualization, lets you play with the data, but that requires programming. But if you want to tell a story and place it in a particular geographical space, then you tell it over a map. And here are some suggestions of tools. If you want to tell a story as it develops over time, then it's a timeline, and here are some tools. So there is a number of, of options here that you can explore, um, and you will end up being able to make all these different formats. Uh, and if we train kids to look at all these different formats, explore these formats in the media, in cultural institutions, and so on, um, build this, this repertoire, being able to decode these things, then the next step is they're, they're going to be able to understand how they work and be able to create all these different things and have a wider range of options for their productions. Right. Um, the next tip is my favorite one. Everything starts with a scribble. Sketch, sketch, sketch. Scribble, scribble, scribble. You don't need to be able to draw. You just need to be able to put your idea down on paper. And we have to start, and this is my favorite creation tool. People often ask me, you know, what's your favorite tool? You know, what's your favorite app? What's your favorite software for creating, for designing? And I always say it's a Sharpie because um, everything starts with visual thinking, and I cannot stress this enough. I often have my, my teachers, when I'm training them, just scribbling things on large pieces of paper, planning what they're going to design, what they're going to develop, and putting that up on the wall so we can talk about it. The next step is allow for creative choice. Um, really, why do we want to say, why do we want to see 20 versions of the same story? Um, say we're talking about the problem of plastic pollution in the environment. One thing I often like to do is let kids pick different um, angles of the story, different parts of the story that they want to tell, or different purposes for their messages. One might be a PSA, one might be a very informative, data-driven story, another one might be a personal story with people that are affected by this problem. And so I let them choose what they want to do, of course, if they have that degree of, of digital literacy and, and maturity. Um, and then they're going to find the best tool. So here we have um, a Google Tour Builder story um, with different parts of the world that are affected by plastic pollution. This one is a little video. It's a PSA, public service announcement. And the one in the bottom is a little data-driven um, piece, interactive piece. So you, you hover your mouse over it. It's actually made on ThingLink. And you hover your mouse and you get all these numbers, shocking facts about plastic pollution. When you put all these things together, you have a very comprehensive story in which kids are actually teaching each other. And that's very nice. One very nice way of doing this is, of course, using choice menus. So this is one that I made recently. But um, you know, if, if kids have a certain degree 
of autonomy and, and digital fluency, then you can work with this kind of thing. And it's, it's actually even uh, a really nice resource to use uh, right now when we're teaching online because um, it, it gives the kids uh, instructions for them to go and do their project and then use the, the synchronous time with the teacher to show and tell and discuss what they found and so on. Um, and then what, one of the things that comes from the design and art direction world that often teachers don't think about is that you have to allot time uh, for all the different stages of your production workflow. And you have to do this in a sequence and you have to have help kids organize this. So you have to plan your project, you have to sketch it out, you have to collect all the elements that you're going to need, your assets, you have to organize them very well before you start working in your Google Drive. Um, then you might want to create any original pieces that you decided that you need, any original video clips or images that you need to shoot. Um, and only when you've done all that, that you can start producing your design or your video or your poster or whatever, and then you'll publish it in the platform of your choice. Now, um, I really like working with Google tools on this because they're easily accessible, they're everywhere. We can use them on our mobile phones and so on. And you can actually have a pretty decent uh, media production workflow just with Google Suite, with G Suite tools. And this is how I broke it down. Planning stage, execution stage, um, and these are all the different tools that you can use for brainstorming, storyboarding, research. These are actual stages in professional media production. Um, storyboarding, research, project management, um, we can take the opportunity to teach about investigation and search, intellectual property images and so on. How do you store and organize and share your assets? Um, Mock-ups, sketches of what you're going to be do, slides or Google drawings, and then on the execution side, anything that's web-based, you can access through Chrome, um, and of course, you can use your Chromebooks and your cell phones to produce. So it's a lot of fun. We can we can do a lot with these resources that are widely available. And then finally, uh, we're going to go back. I think we still have a few minutes. We're going to go back to our story about the Olympics, the questions that you had. How are you guys doing so far? So far, so good? So let's do the, the last part of our exercise here. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions, which is go back to our um, document here and then try to think of what would be the best way to present the story that you wanted to investigate. Is it a photo essay? Is it an interview? Is it an article? Does it have charts? Does it have, um, is it an interactive? Is it a fun game maybe? Is it a video explainer? Let's see what you can come up with. The local communities because you can um, you can have a first person narrative there. Okay. I don't know if I'm still connected. Yes, connected. So a photo essay will be a really nice way of actually showing what happened to those people and letting them speak for themselves, right? Uh, montage of video clips to show training. How have people been preparing for the Olympics with the virus? Um, Vox Media does a really nice job with the video explainers. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but it's video clips with commentary with sentences over them. And that's actually a really nice format to use with kids because it's easy to produce and they could come up with eight or 10 sentences to carry their story through. 
and then they could uh, have a montage of images behind. How did COVID affect athletes training? Yes, that would be a really great story to tell with data. Um, especially if you can compare uh, before and after numbers of trainings or kilometers traveled, miles traveled, um, all of those things would be great. Map layers to show impact on the environment. Yes, VR tour, excellent. That would be great. VR is very impactful because, you know, it, it puts you right there and you have instant empathy. How do athletes train for their sport if they don't have the money? Interactive timelines, interviews. Yeah, that's probably a story that's very much people driven, right? You, you want to hear their first person stories. You want to hear their, their troubles, their difficulties, what solutions they come up with. So that's probably one way you want to have big photos of them or you want to have them actually speak. Where do athletes stay? Well, that would be a nice VR story to do, right? An interactive tour of the, of the villages, and then you could layer on information about the cost and special features and so on, right? So um, you get the idea. What financial support has been provided but to the runners competing? Interactive infographic. Comparison of athlete compensation support sorted by finish. Yes, that would be great. That would be great. The nice thing about interactive infographics is that you get to play with them. You get to play with the variables and then you get to draw your own conclusions. The not so nice thing about interactive infographics is that you need programming to do them. But, you know, if you have a friend, you can do it. You get the idea, right? So um, I'm going to go back here. I think that some very nice ideas. Um, I'm hoping that you can then look at um, other people's ideas too, and we can comment on this document later on. I would invite you to do that so that we can actually um, have a finished document and everybody gets to look at everybody else's contribution. And I think I'm getting to the end of my spiel here. Yes, I am. Um, I would like to suggest that you... I'm going to share these slides with you, um, and I'd like to suggest that you take a look if you have some time at this video. It's about 15 minutes long, but this was the project that I did at the end of the uh, um, Summer Institute in Digital Literacy uh, last July in Providence, Rhode Island with uh, Professor Renee Hobbs of the Media Education Lab, um, and this was my final project. So it's a little video, and it's in English about media literacy in the 21st century classroom. Um, and this is the link to these slides, bit.ly slash like a journalist. So you can access these nice charts. Um, and please feel free to contact me. I'd like to hear from you. I'd love to hear about your own media projects in your context and find out what you're doing. So let me copy this bit.ly like a journalist and I'm going to stop sharing. And I think um, we still have about 10 minutes if anybody wants to. There. I'm back. Data Studio for Infographics, yes. Um, you know, there are some resources now that you can access, um, that you can do infographics, interactive things with a very basic level of programming. So more and more of these things are being made. Um, I've, I've used with kids in um, middle school, I've used some tools that were uh, very accessible, that were developed by, by, for the media lab at I think the Pointer Institute. No, I don't think it was Pointer. I, But um, I forget what it was, but I can put it here at the end of the slides. But um, it's a timeline maker. Um, it's the Knight Center for Journalism, actually. And these are tools that are used by uh, media outlets like the Washington Post um, and the New York Times. One is a slider that lets you see uh, images, compare images over time. 
So you just slide the slider and you get to see the same image before and after a period of time. Um, the other one is a timeline maker. And basically you plug in all your information, your images, link to your images and your captions in a spreadsheet, in a Google spreadsheet. And it makes this beautiful interactive timeline for you. Um, these are tools available um, from the Knight Center for Journalism that I've used in a school context. They're very nice. Canva is very nice. Um, how to assess creativity as a skill? How to do that? That's actually a really great question, Sabrina. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, this is one of those situations where rubrics are really nice and really help us because um, we don't want to be evaluating these things. We don't want to be assessing these things at a very subjective level, obviously. And if we're talking about build, building certain media literacy skills, there are clear things that we want to achieve. For example, um, using research well, citing sources, citing your images, uh, the, your choice of imagery. Is it supporting your thesis, your argument, your storyline? Um, did you develop your story correctly? And so if, if you create these things in a rubric, um, it helps students build their media piece because they know what to look for they know what's expected um, along research, along um, image, along production, um, and so on. And it helps you grade it, it helps you assess, assess it. So let me take a quick look, see if anybody has uh, questions. Yeah, Jacqueline, very nice. Uh, media is content created for a purpose. So journalistic inquiry results in a story. Yes, academic inquiry might result in an argument. Yes. Um, the only thing that I wanted to, this is a very nice observation, thank you. The only thing that I want to say is that for our purposes here, for the purpose of media literacy education, um, when we say media, we are referring to anything that carries a message um, and it was created with purpose but it doesn't have to be only journalism. It could be um, packaging, it could be a t-shirt, it could be a meme, it could be a post on social media and so on. And so we, we wanna be able to consider all these pieces of, of text, all these texts as messages um, that we can decode and that we can create um, to convey a story. Okay, what else do we have here? Yep, they start by deconstructing mentor, mentor text to identify the elements they need to create. Yes, that's a good strategy. That's a very good strategy. So uh, decoding is really important. Um, to, to build critical thinking, to, to um, train kids to reflect upon the messages with intent um, and with some guidelines as to what to look for, um, authorship, purpose, impact. Who is included in this message? Who's represented? Who is not? Who might be offended? What kind of discourse? Is it offensive? Is it hate speech? Um, what's the nature of this piece of, of communication? And once they do that, um, they can also turn these questions around to themselves as authors and reflect on what they're creating and the choices they're making as authors. I think we're getting uh, to the end of our time. So if anybody has any more questions, let me see up here if somebody said something else. The daily Just going to say a big thank you for um, <clears throat> uh, presenting the webinar this evening. Some really useful content in there um, and some really thank interesting you. discussion points and, and obviously resources people can go back to. So thank you for sharing those out with us. Um, You're welcome. And I'd, I'd just like to add that if you have any media uh, creation projects that you do in your context, I'd love to hear about them. Um, we're always looking for things to to share and showcase, and it would be lovely to hear from you. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, everyone, for stopping by. And, and good luck with the rest of the work in Brazil. I've seen it. I'm, I'm very lucky to have had some of the resources that you produced, and I brought some back with me from my visit. Um, and there's some really nice work coming out of that project that you're, you're that's become now a full-time piece for you, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It has. 
And um, we've been training people all over Brazil. We've moved online for a little bit, but um, you know, we're doing the work. Thank you, Andy. Thank you all so much for stopping by and um, hope to see you very soon at the next at the next Innovator Chat. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, I will see everyone in the chat soon as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.